Okay, so the aim of this webinar is to find out who is doing what uh, on electric vehicle charging with, with the objective of uh, developing a fit for purpose um, electric vehicle charging infrastructure. This is particularly relevant in the UK at this moment as the government just announced a consultation on smart charging, uh, which could be used to become legislation. Uh, so, uh, government wants to find out what are the requirements to make uh, a charging point have smart functionalities. And I'm hoping that learnings from around the world could help inform uh, some of the policy developments happening in the UK. Uh, so, we have created a landing page uh, for these webinars. Uh, the landing page will uh, contain information uh, like the recordings, uh, the slides and also details for future events. Uh, those webinars will be a mix of uh, uh, focus on policy, uh, but also on uh, research and maybe industrial learning. So today the webinar is focused on research. The following two uh, are more on communication protocols used in a real world setting. The third one is going to be focused on policy. Uh, the link is below uh, and it, uh, of the landing page if you wanted to register for the upcoming ones. Okay, uh, before we start the presentation uh, from our speakers, um, I wanted to uh, introduce my work. Uh, I work for Newcastle University and I recently started the Turing Institute to start a group on vehicle grid integration. Uh, the aim of the group is to use data science to modernize transport and electricity infrastructure. There's a lot, of, a lot of things happening at the Turing. A lot of methods are being developed. And uh, one of my main objectives is to try to understand what is happening here and try and apply them, apply methods that have already been developed and apply them in the context of electricity and transport. That does not exclude methods developed in other places. So we are always happy to, uh, to share and collaborate with people developing methods that want to apply them into transport and um, electricity uh, context. Some of our work also uh, includes contributing to, to communication protocols, open communication protocols to integrate electric vehicles into uh, the electricity infrastructure. One of the main things uh, we are doing here at the Vehicle Grid Integration Group is a project called IFO Future. Uh, IFO Future is a large demonstrator on vehicle to grid. Now, vehicle to grid is a technology that allows to charge the electric cars, but also discharge them into the electricity networks to help support this network. Uh, it is funded by Innovate UK through uh, uh, funding came from the uh, Department from Trans for Transport and the Department for Business Energy and Industrial Strategy. The Office for Low Emission Vehicles in the UK goes across both the Department for Transport and the Department for Business Energy and Industrial Strategy. We have a car manufacturers on board and we also have uh, electricity companies. And this is one of the significance of this project. It's bringing together two big industries that never worked together before, but they have to collaborate if we are to decarbonize our transport and electricity system. So as I mentioned, the plan is to roll out up to 1,000 vehicle to grid chargers across the UK. The focus is on fleet. We want to investigate what is the optimal use case for vehicle to grid. Uh, in some cases, um, offering your car for the electricity network might not make sense, and others it might, so we want to understand when it does. Uh, we want to understand and try and overcome some of the challenges, being technical in aggregating a large number of electric vehicles when they are charging and discharging. We are also working with customers. This is a real-world uh, trial. So, uh, the willingness of the customers to participate is important and we want to understand that. Uh, in addition, 
these are uh, this this infrastructure is connected to the internet and it could be prone to attacks so we want to understand the security aspects of this and uh, some other policy and regulatory barriers okay the work is divided into several work packages in newcastle our focus is on uh, collecting and analyzing data from customers uh, but also uh, collecting data from the networks, building distribution network models, and then simulating the impacts of these EVs with vehicle to grid and the benefits. So how could vehicle to grid help support the electricity network to make sure it makes sense for the distribution network operators or the system operator to use this type of distributed energy resource if you want to look at, at it like this, to help them maintain reliability and security of supply. As I mentioned, we are also working on the security of this infrastructure, security of the software, the hardware and communication. And our part here is to assess and uh, present recommendations to our industrial partners. We just started with the project. The first 20 chargers are planned to be installed by the end of September at the Nissan Technical Center in Cranfield. This is an overview. Uh, so we have those chargers. Uh, they are to be controlled by an aggregator. The cars and the chargers and the network would send information. Based on that information, some control commands are sent with the aim to support both DSOs, TSO, and most importantly, who are making sure the user are met. Uh, once we start collecting data, so uh, early, mid next year, we start developing the models, we start doing some analysis, you could find more information information on what we're doing either on the website uh, of the Turing group or through potentially a following webinar. So please do uh, connect if you want more information or if you want to collaborate on sharing some of your methods. And uh, I will now leave our speakers to present their work. I just wanted to check if uh, Don is on. Don seems to have problems connecting. That's, so we will just switch a bit on the agenda and we get uh, Zach to start his presentation. Can everyone hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, Zach. So it should be fine. Great. Okay. Well, uh, Thank you, Miriam. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, so my name is uh, Zach Lee. I'm a PhD student at Caltech right now, uh, working on smart EV charging systems. And so uh, I was just asked to, to kind of provide an overview of what uh, we've been doing, um, kind of our perspective on this. And I'll also mention some of the open tools that we've been creating um, that some of you might be interested in using um, in your own work. Uh, so first, have to mention all of the great people who have been working on the project throughout the years. Uh, PowerFlex, which is this PF over on the uh, left-hand side of your screen, is uh, PowerFlex Systems. So that's a startup that is commercializing uh, the research I'm, I'll talk to you guys about today. Um, they currently have around 50 large-scale EV charging sites around the United States. Um, and then there's been a large research effort at Caltech and some visiting students um, from the U.S. as well as Europe that have worked on the project. Um, so I'll start off just with a little bit. I think with this audience, we don't need to be told about the importance of EV charging, but uh, IEA in their 30 at, EV30 at 30 scenario estimate somewhere around 250 million EVs on the road by 2030. And that represents around 640 terawatt hours of demand yearly um, in 2030. And so this is a huge amount of load um, that can be, depending on if you're a pessimist or an optimist, this is either a big problem or a big opportunity. Um, 
And so the, the drill into that a little further, we know based on our data from real sites, the average EV needs around 10 kilowatt hours a day. Um, for our sites, we use kind of uh, mid-range level two charging at around seven kilowatts. Uh, level two can get all the way up to 19.2 kilowatts, but we're kind of in more of, these are kind of the most common, at least in the US, in terms of power range. If you compare that to the average uh, U.S. household, uh, the average home uses around 29 kilowatt hours a day. And so we're talking about a third as much energy as an entire home and uh, a significant amount of power to charge all these vehicles. Um, and so that's a lot when you have one vehicle, but we're interested in what we would consider large-scale EV charging. And so when you think about that, think of a parking lot that maybe has 100 EVs or several hundred EVs. Uh, these are, com I think, going to be common in workplaces, um, large apartment complexes, movie theaters, shopping centers, grocery stores, basically anywhere that people leave their car for a significant amount of time, it starts to make sense to offer charging there. Um, and so once you aggregate all of those EVs, you're talking about up to 700 kilowatts of demand um, and a megawatt hour of energy need daily. And so this is huge, but these EVs um, are pretty flexible. And we'll talk about kind of how we can take advantage of that in a second. Um, but first, the issue, if you want, if you operate a parking structure, for example, and you want to be able to install all of these charging stations uh, kind of with a state-of-the-art systems, you need to plan for that peak. So you have to build out infrastructure, whether that means upgrading your transformer, your um, breakers and, and uh, breaker boxes, your utility service, and anything like that, and that's very expensive. Um, but as I mentioned, these EVs have a lot of flexibility, so if we think smarter about how we use them and how we charge them, um, we can actually significantly reduce those costs. And so that's been one of the drivers, at least in the early days, of the Adaptive Charging Network project, was really being able to oversubscribe these key pieces of infrastructure so we can drive down the capital cost of installing large numbers of EV chargers. Um, so part one of this talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we mean when we talk about controlled EV charging. Um, and so first, just a little cartoon. So, so drivers in general, in workplace environments, in apartment complexes, and all these places where people spend a significant amount of time, uh, do have a large amount of flexibility. So in this use case, uh, say this is Alexandria, and she is going to arrive at work at 8 a.m. Um, and needs to leave for a lunch meeting at 12 noon. And she needs 10 kilowatt hours of energy. And so there's lots of ways that we could charge her. Um, we could charge her at the maximum rate of the charging station, and she gets done around 9.30, and she's happy. We could charge her uniformly across the entire time period, or we could do something interesting with our charging schedule um, and vary it throughout time. And so recognizing that flexibility is really what allows us to start thinking about, well, how can we schedule and aggregate these EV charging systems. Um, so based on real systems, um, we can start to look at how much flexibility do drivers actually have. Um, and so we first, I don't know if you're familiar with the term of laxity. So the idea of laxity is basically, if you take the amount of time a driver is actually going to leave their car there, we refer to that as dwell time or the session duration. And you subtract from that the minimum amount of time it would take to charge that car. So if I charge the car at the maximum possible charging rate, that would be the minimum charging time. And so the difference between those is the amount of flexibility in terms of hours uh, that we have when we consider how much charging or how much flexibility we have when we kind of can shift around charging load. And so with that definition of laxity, if you look at our Caltech site, well, we have 54 charging stations, we can see that over 80% of users have over an hour of laxity available, and about 50% of users actually have more than five hours of laxity available. And what happens when we aggregate that is we start to be able to say, 
that we can significantly oversubscribe infrastructure. And this is uh, just a cartoon where we only consider five EVs. On the uh, left-hand side, we consider conventional charging. So here, each vehicle is just, dry, is just charging as quickly as it possibly can. Um, and we can see that that actually overloads the power limit of this small-scale charging system. And on the right, you can see with adaptive charging, uh, which I'll explain to you the algorithms we use to do that in, on, in an online setting, we can actually make sure that everyone is still getting the same amount of energy. So their energy request is all being met, but we're able to stay below that power limit. And so that's what allows us to reduce the capital cost and also uh, operating costs when you have to deal with demand charge, which is a common thing in the United States at least, where you're actually charged based on your peak demand over a billing period. So I'll step into a little bit of how do we actually take advantage of that flexibility. And to understand it first, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the EV charging model that we use. So we consider that there are in EV, we'll index them with I, um, and we do a discrete time model. So we have T, big T control intervals. Generally, these are one minute or five minute intervals. Um, and we'll, we'll just number them as well with little t. So each EV is described by four numbers. The first is their energy request, uh, which we'll consider in amp hours. Um, I think we'll assume that voltage in, within our charging system is more or less nominal. We have their arrival and departure time. And then we have the maximum charging rate. And this is determined both by the EV's onboard charger and also by the maximum charging rate of the EVSC that the EV is plugged into. And so what we used is a, in a model predictive control-based approach. So we'll collect all of the active charging sessions that are happening in the system. Um, and then we'll ask if it's time to recompute a new schedule. And so when we need to recompute a new schedule is whenever a new EV arrives to the system, whenever an EV leaves the system, for, uh, they unplug and leave, or we might do it periodically. And we do this because um, our models of the system may not be completely accurate. And so by resolving periodically, we're able to close the feedback loop and me take measurements of how much energy we actually delivered to the cars and let that inform how much energy we still need to deliver. Um, if we do need to recompute a new schedule, we'll call an algorithm, we'll call SCH, and I'll talk about that in the next slide, what that algorithm looks like. Um, and then after that, or if we didn't need to recompute a schedule, we'll deploy one time period of the charging schedule, and we'll send that through our network to the actual EVs. Um, and then we'll measure, based on feedback, how much what the actual charging rate of the EV is, because it may not follow the pilot signal we send to it directly. Um, and then the loop starts again. We'll take a little bit uh, of a look of the, of the SCH algorithm. So it takes the form of an optimization problem. So this is a convex optimization problem, which we can solve uh, quickly in, in real time and real systems. Uh, so we have a utility function that we want to maximize. Um, this can take lots of forms, and we've experimented with all of these. Uh, you may want to maximize the prof your profit. Um, say you have some revenue per unit energy, and you would like to maximize that with respect to time of use prices or uh, with demand charge or other things like that. You may just want to charge everyone as quickly as possible. So subject to the constraints of your infrastructure, we just want to get as much energy out as we possibly can. Um, you may want to maximize the use of renewable energy or follow some kind of demand response signal. And all of these are valid uh, utility functions to plug into this algorithm. The first constraint says uh, that we will not discharge the battery. So in our current implementation, we're not considering vehicle to grid. Um, we're only charging, and we have a maximum charging rate, which was described in the EV model. Um, we're not going to charge a car after it's supposed to leave. The amount of energy we're going to deliver to the car 
is less than or equal to the energy that that car requested. So this constraint can look a little weird. The reason we do this is that by setting this, uh, strengthening this constraint to equality, if a user provides an infeasible energy request, so, so we actually get this E sub I directly from the user, and if they ask, for example, for more energy than is possible to deliver to them um, over the, the space of time they're going to be charging, then this problem would become infeasible and we wouldn't get anything out of it. So by relaxing this to a less than or equals uh, constraint, we can actually always get a feasible solution because not charging anyone is a feasible solution. And then we can control using the utility function that so long as the utility function is increasing in every element in the vector R, which is the charging rates to every car, we can actually prove that this constraint will be tight if it is feasible for it to be tight. Um, and so that, that's kind of why that constraint is in that form. And then the last constraint, uh, which I'll dig into in a little bit, is these infrastructure constraints. And so these are things like the limits imposed by the transformers, the lines, the utility service to your charging network. So I mentioned kind of these utility functions. Um, we can actually have a utility function that's a weighted sum of many sub functions. Um, one of them might be the quick charge objective. Here, the weights on all of the charging rates are monotonically increasing in time. And so this is actually false. <laughs> Oops. Uh, it's monotonically decreasing in time. There's a typo there. Um, and what that means is that we want to move as much charging as possible forward in the, uh, in the period. So you want to charge everyone as quickly as you possibly can. Uh, we can also maximize our profit with time of use tariffs. So here P of T is the revenue at time T and C of T is the cost at time T. And we can actually uh, maximize our profit. So this revenue might be real. It might be what you charge users. It could also be uh, a purely um, kind of fictional quantity. Um, so you might say, I'm willing to charge people for free, but I'm not going to pay more than this amount um, per unit energy. And so if the cost of energy ever goes above that amount, then don't charge anyone. Um, and then we can also use uh, include demand charge. So here the VEC is the same as with the time of use tariff, but we have this additional term uh, where delta hat is a proxy for the demand charge. Um, we have a paper coming out about how to set up this proxy, but for now, just it's it's a it's some function of the actual demand charge, um, and you have to mess with it a little bit because we're optimizing over, say, a 12-hour window, but this demand charge is, caught, is charged over an entire month. And so we have to actually scale that demand factor in a smart way uh, so that we can actually charge people. Uh, we also include other loads that might be on the site and the previous peak throughout the billing period. We can also include some regularizers. So the quick charge objective, in addition to being its own objective, can be used as a regularizer. For example, if you have very flat time of use schedules, um, if you include this quick charge term with some small weight, you'll actually push charging forward in the plateaus of the time of use rates. Um, you can also have smoothing. So if you, you take the the difference between the current charging rate for a car and its previous one, and we can minimize um, the square of that. And that will actually smooth out the charging profile for each car, which could be desirable um, from a user perspective because users don't tend to like really spiky uh, charging profiles for their cars, even though there's no solid research that shows that that's bad for a car's battery. Um, from a user perspective, it doesn't look good. Um, or we can have kind of an equal sharing uh, regularizer, which says all things being equal um, for the rest of the utility function, I might want to equally share amongst all of the EVs. And so if you pick uh, a small enough weighting factor to this, uh, you won't affect the primary objective, but you can actually say, um, I want to share equally 
um, given that the cost function, uh, the rest of the cost function is the same. So in order to implement something like this, um, we need a couple of things. One, we need charging hardware that allows us to have real-time control and feedback of the actual charging rate of the car. Um, we also need input from the user. Uh, specifically, we need an estimate of their departure time and how much energy they would like. Um, and we'd like these things to be fairly accurate because we're going to use them in our algorithm to as, as an estimate of when the person is actually going to leave and as that upper bound on how much energy we're going to deliver to them. We can also uh, get a willingness to pay from the user. Um, this is something we're experimenting with, um, but I won't have time to talk about it today. Um, we also need information. Primarily, we need information about the constraints on our infrastructure, uh, but we also might need information depending on our objective around the tariff structure, some kind of demand response signals the user uh, that the utility might be sending us, how much solar production we have on site, what the load of our building is, and then forecast for all of these things so that we can incorporate them into our model predictive control framework. So to get these signals and to try these, these algorithms out in practice, we developed the adaptive charging network. Um, so you'll hear me referring to this throughout the rest of the talk as the ACN. So ACN is the adaptive charging network. So a short history of the ACN. Um, it started purely in research uh, in around 2012. We were interested in distributed energy resources, demand response, and things like that. This was before my time. Um, in 2016, the first ACN testbed was installed at Caltech. It had 54 of these custom EVSEs that had this nice touch screen and thing. Um, that lasted for around a year. Um, and PowerFlex, which is the company that spun out of this research, um, I actually realized that while we could do a lot with these custom EVSEs, to scale the technology and put it around the country required us to work with commercial EVSEs. So we partnered with a couple of companies. One is AeroVironment, which has now changed its name and has been bought. Um, I don't remember its new name. Uh, the other is Clipper Creek, which is another EVSE manufacturer, um, and Tesla, and a couple of others now. Um, so these are commercial EVSEs, which we actually modify so that we can control them and monitor them in real time. Um, so we swapped out all of the original legacy, what we call uh, EVSEs for these commercially available ones in around 2017. And since then, PowerFlex has deployed over 50 of these um, for a total of around 2,000 EVSEs around the United States. And so um, that's provided us with a lot of experience in how these real systems operate, a uh, wealth of data, and, uh, and has been able to prove out this, this technology and this system. So as I mentioned, uh, the ACNs are kind of around the country. Um, some places you might have heard of, uh, SLAC, the Stanford Linear Accelerator Lab, has a deployment, the National Renewable Energy Lab, uh, does as well. Uh, we're in a number of schools in both the San Francisco Bay Area and the Los Angeles area. Um, Caltech is down there um, and JPL as well. And so this is a, a couple of the sites that we have. Uh, there are many more. Um, here's some photos of real sites. Um, so on the left, we have a junior high school that has a deployment. They also have on-site solar. Um, and so we're doing some experiments with how do we, how does that on-site solar play into how we charge EVs? Um, and then we have a jet propulsion laboratory and an apartment complex in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, so I'll zoom in to just kind of show you the, the architecture of the system on the Caltech uh, example. So at Caltech, we have um, right now around 80 EVSEs, they're split into two networks, so I'll describe one of them for simplicity. Uh, this one has 54 charging stations. Um, as you can see, there, there are two transformers, so we're looking at the output of one of these transformers. It's 150 uh, kilovolt amps, and it drives through a switch panel, 
um, 19 of these pods of two uh, EVSEs and then two pods of eight. And so the reason these pods exist is actually when we switched from the original uh, legacy custom chargers to the commercially available ones, we did a many to one replacement. And so we replaced one with either two or eight. Um, and so the reason we were doing that is we were experimenting with how oversubscribed could we, do, could we make the infrastructure and how scalable is this system. Um, and so really what this allows us to do is all of this just becomes new constraints to our optimization problem. And we're able to not worry about what was the line feeding that. So for example, the lines feeding these pods of eight only has 80 amps of capacity. Each of these chargers is 32 amps. Um, so we're significantly oversubscribed but we're able to, to not blow any breakers because we can use that optimization algorithm to make sure that we're always not violating that constraint. Um, and there's also a DC fast charger at the site as well. So in the, in the previous slide, what I showed you was kind of a nice tree structure that made it look uh, a little bit more simple than it is because in reality, each of these EVSEs is a, a single phase load that's connected in delta, so line-to-line -line connections. So here we describe those, uh, we kind of group them together, where each of these is, if we take the group of all EVSEs that are connected, for example, between phases A and B, um, we'll call that I EVSE AB, um, and we need to make sure we don't violate this constraint on this line. And we, we describe that in terms of these uh, currents in this delta configuration. And we can do some math, um, and what we find is that this becomes um, what's known as a second-order cone constraint. So we have a, it's a norm on the, uh, the actual uh, current that we have. And so that, the nice thing about this formulation is it still fits within our optimization. It's still convex, and we can still solve it efficiently. Um, but we actually do need to factor in this unbalanced three-phase system because if we don't, and I'll show an example later, uh, we'll actually violate these line constraints. So even if we, if we just considered back here and said, oh, all of these chargers uh, need to be less than 150 kilowatts, uh, we might actually violate some of the line constraints within the system. So that's the physical infrastructure. Now looking at the cyber infrastructure. So we start with these commercial EVSEs. We add communication via XB. Uh, those communicate to an on-site server um, that then communicates via cellular network to our, the PowerFlex cloud. And that allow, that's where we can compute schedules, um, run that optimization problem, as well as store all of our data in databases. And then to get user data, we use a mobile app that's also developed by PowerFlex. And so this allows users to input what time they plan to leave and how much energy they need. And we actually ask that in the form of how many miles of range would you like to add to your car? Because what we find is that users don't generally understand the concept of kilowatt hours. They understand miles far more. So this is the, the dashboard that PowerFlex puts out, um, tells you a little bit about the state of the system at any point in time. So over the past three years, um, the Caltech network has delivered around 800 megawatt hours of energy. Um, you can kind of see what the impact of that is in terms of uh, miles, around 25 or 2.5 million miles of electric charge, um, lots of CO2 avoided. Uh, you can also look at a time series of the peak power the amount of energy we deliver. Um, and if you're ever interested in this, you can go to caltech.powerflex.com and there's a live version of this dashboard at all times that you can check out if you're interested. You can also, on that same dashboard, look at the, the actual charging rates of cars. Um, so the, here the uh, yellow line is the pilot signal or the control signal that we send to the car. And the green line is actually the actual charging rate of the car. Um, and what we see 
is uh, an interesting behavior that we, we notice a lot is this uh, battery ramp down. So as a vehicle nears 100% state of charge, the battery charging mode switches into uh, a constant voltage mode, uh, which actually decreases the power draw um, over time. And that's what we see here. Um, and then we try to regain that capacity um, in our pilot signal so that we can provide it to other cars uh, because the car is not going to charge uh, at the maximum rate. If, for example, we left that pilot signal at 32 amps the whole time. And then this is just for nostalgic sake um, and to show some of the control that we can do. So my first project when I got to Caltech in the fall of 2016 was to demonstrate that we could actually use the aggregate charging power of EVs to uh, control EV charging. And so, or we can to follow PV generation. So here the blue line is the PV generation. The yellow line is the aggregate charging power of the EVs. Um, and so you can see that we're actually able to limit charging of the EVs in times when solar generation is low throughout the day. Um, and we, can all, we see that we don't always match the peaks and that's because we saturate the amount of EV charging that's available. Uh, for example, here, uh, everyone's out to lunch. And there's not enough EVs to soak up all of the power from the TV generation. Um, so I think I, I've talked for a while. Um, I'll just briefly mention the, the work that we have ongoing um, for bringing the tools and uh, insights that we've learned from building these real systems uh, to kind of the broader research community. And so we call that the ACN Research Portal. The goal of it is really to bridge the gap from theory to practice. And what we see is there are three things really needed. Oh, no. Hmm. Uh, this is cut off a little bit uh, for, for bridging that gap. And the first is access to real-world data, which we have from our charging systems. The second is detailed simulations that are driven by realistic models of charging systems. And the third is the ability to test algorithms in the field. And so the ACN research portal really exists um, to, to meet that need um, in the community. And so uh, the first phase was building the ACN testbed, which I talked about already. Uh, the second phase is ACN data, which is our open data set of over 35,000 EV charging sessions. Um, and that's available um, to the public. It's online. I'll show you, give you a link in a moment uh, of how you can access that data. It includes information about uh, the arrival time, departure time, and energy request of EVs, as well as time series of the actual charging rate and the pilot signals that we send to the EVs, um, and some other information, user data, or information that we collect from the user as well. Uh, the second phase is ACN SIM, which is our open source simulator for these kind of large scale EV charging systems. Um, and it, it connects directly to ACN data so that you can actually pull in simulation scenarios that actually happened in real charging networks. Um, and then we have models of the actual charging networks and the constraints um, that exist in them. So you can basically test how your algorithm would have performed if it was controlling the physical system. Uh, we're working on phase three and four now, which is integrating the simulator with OpenAI Gem, which is a framework for reinforcement learning as well as with grid simulators. Um, so you can test the effect of large-scale EV charging on the grid. And then ACN Live, which is the last part of this, um, is actually a framework for doing hardware in the loop testing of algorithms. The way this works is that once you've tested an algorithm with ACN Sim and you're happy with it and we're happy with it, um, you can actually now deploy that algorithm onto real adaptive charging networks at Caltech and hopefully at, at JPL as well. And so that allows you to do real field tests. And the nice thing is the way these systems are set up, once you've implemented your algorithm in ACM SIM, there's only one line of code that needs to be changed so that it can now run on real systems. And so there's a nice interface class that can just be swapped out and your algorithm doesn't know the difference between simulated uh, infrastructure and real infrastructure. And we have some things on the back end that make sure that 
everyone's protected, um, everyone's getting charged by the end of the day, the infrastructure is protected and things like that. So briefly, ACN data has 35,000 EV charging sessions. It's publicly available. It's growing daily at roughly 90 sessions a day. Um, this shows you a little bit of how many sessions we've added each month um, over a year period ending last May. Um, this is some of the data that's available. Uh, we don't have a ton of time, so I'll skip over for some of this, but this is the types of data that you can gather from the data set. Um, there's a lot that you can do, whether that's in machine learning and statistical modeling, algorithm design and evaluation, or system design and grid impacts, um, because all of these are, are inherently based on real data um, and the distribution of that data. So I'll, I'll skip over some of this. It, uh, we'll, I'll provide the slides to everyone if you're interested in some of the things we've done with the data. Um, I want to skip forward to talk a little bit about okay so if you're interested in accessing the data set um, it's available at ev.caltech.edu we have a couple of different ways for you to access it whether that's through an interface the web the web um, an api a python client or acn sim will actually pull the data in directly using the api um, i'll mention acn sim for a moment um, it's an open source and extensible simulator it's designed for online testing algorithms with real-time feedback um, it has seamless integration with ACM data so that you can pull in real charging scenarios. Um, it has accurate models of many of the system uh, things like EVSEs, uh, electrical infrastructure, et cetera. And it makes it easy for you to share your experiments because everyone has access to the same data and the same simulator. Um, it has uh, this kind of modular architecture where we model batteries, EVs, EVSEs, uh, the constraints of the charging network, um, it's event driven, and this is the interface that I mentioned earlier that allows your algorithm to not know whether it's dealing with a simulator or with a real system. So a couple of just experiments we've been able to do with that. Uh, I mentioned earlier the importance of considering three phase constraints. So this is a least laxity first algorithm uh, with a 50 kilowatt capacity. Um, what we see here is that even if we we stay below the 50 kilowatt capacity. When we actually consider the three phase lines, we're actually violating those constraints. Uh, but if we consider those individually, we can actually stay below their, the line limits. Um, so another uh, example of how we can test different algorithms against one another, um, here varying transformer capacity. So this is the adaptive charging algorithm I mentioned earlier that uses model predictive control. We can also look at profit maximization with time of use uh, charges and compare algorithms that way. Um, so that's a little bit about uh, the project we've been working on. I think I went a little over the 30 minutes I was allotted. So um, I don't know if we have time for questions, but if you're interested at all in using the data set, the simulator, um, or just have other questions about the work we've been doing, feel free to email me. My email is there, uh, zlee at Caltech. Um, and if you're interested more in the projects that we have going on, you can go to ev.caltech.edu. Um, that's where the data set is. There's a link to the simulator and some more information about the different research projects we have going on around EV charging. So, thanks. Thank you so much, Dad. This is excellent. Uh, it's also great to see that an algorithm that uh, was developed at university is actually used in a, in a real world uh, uh, situation but also the open data set you're making available it is not very common at all to have access to data uh, the charging data from cars so i'm sure a lot of people will find what you're making available very valuable i really look forward to having you here at turing maybe we can test some of the things you're developing on the data set we are going to collect Yeah, that would be great. Yeah, yeah, we're happy to hopefully the data set will be useful for, for lots of people and, and hopefully uh, that will kind of allow you to test some of the algorithms as you're collecting your own data from what I think is going to be a really cool pilot. Yeah, uh, if anyone has a question, you can use the chat uh, option and write it down and uh, either I can read it now if you ask it fast or I can leave it till the end. 
Meanwhile, I think Don managed to join. Uh, Don, are you able to share your screen? Uh, Zach, you'll have to stop sharing, please. Mute. Can you hear me? Excellent. Hi, Don. Oh, how are you Mute. doing? Stop my share. Um, I'm not able to share my screen. Can you just... Yeah, I'm trying to... So, so Zach is just about to uh, stop sharing. There we go. Would you like to try now? Okay, let me see here. Yeah, can can you just, Miriam, can you pull up my slides and I'll just, you can flip through them for me? Yeah, I'll do that. And I do have a shorter presentation, so there should be time for questions at the end, I think. All right. <clears throat> so um, the presentation I'm giving is talking about a EV charging control strategy that was developed in a Department of Energy um, project, a, a vehicle technologies office project. And uh, the control strategy is looking at controlling, you know, large numbers of electric vehicles um, to do things like, you know, flatten system load, uh, you know, reduce the ramping and the duct curve, and so on. So, so it's it, the focus of it was looking at controlling the charging in a computationally efficient way of tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of vehicles. Okay, so let's go to the, can we go to the next slide, please? So uh, just a quick introduction. Oh, the other thing about this presentation is, I'll, I'll mention, is this is a very high level presentation. There's not a lot of technical details in it. Um, but if there's interest, if any of the individuals on the, car, on the call would be interested in having more technical details, then we have other information, other slides and papers that we could share describing that. So this is just gonna be very high level. Um, but to start with, uh, the, the foundation of this work was built off of things that we learned in a project called the EV Project. Um, the EV Project um, is a project in the United States that started roughly 10 years ago, and it was um, getting information and data from uh, electric vehicles, charging behavior for, you know, thousands, like six or 8,000 electric vehicles in 10 different metropolitan areas in the United States over a three-year time period. And from that project, a lot of things that were learned that um, at this point are, are somewhat obvious. Um, but one thing is that a lot of electric vehicle charging occurs at residences. You know, and this, there may be things that cause us to change in time as, you know, as there's individuals who buy electric vehicles that don't have an opportunity to charge at their residential location like apartment buildings and so on. But, um, and as there's more public infrastructure available to charge, possibly the, the amount of charging at home will decrease. But the amount of charging at home, there's, there's a strong economic incentive. And there, in a lot of cases, there, there will continue to be quite a bit of home charging into the future. Um, and when people, individuals charge at home, um, their charging occurs coincident with their, with their non-charging peak for residential load. So when you look at a residential load profile, you know, typically it, in the middle of the night at three in the morning is when it's the lowest. You know, the lights are off, the TV's off, you know, people aren't running their washer machine. The peak load tends to be the lowest, and they wake up in the morning, they turn on some loads, the load increases a little bit in early morning hours, then it tends to kind of flatten out during the day. And then in the evening hours, when the kids come home from school and, and you know, the individuals come home from work, you get another, the load begins to increase again until you have your, your, your peak load in the evening hours. Um, and the way the individuals tend to um, charge their vehicles at home is when they when they arrive home 
from wherever they were at, they park their vehicle in their garage and they tend to plug it in. And so the vehicle starts charging as soon as they get home, which is the same time as when the individual walks in the house and begins to turn on other loads. So we, so we get this, this situation where the, the EV charging load is coincident with the non-EV charging load peak. And this can be problematic because this can drastically increase the, increase the peak load of residential or on-residential feeders. Um, the other thing that's very, um, that's kind of unique to residential charging or, or one of the dominant characteristics of residential charging is vehicles tend to be located at the house for a considerable period of time over the nighttime hours. I mean, individual arrives home and typically after it's the last trip of the day, their vehicle tends to be parked from anywhere from 8 to 14 hours at the residence. So there's a considerable opportunity to charge at home. Um, and so what we began to look at is, is, the, is the first use case is you can see that A, individuals, you know, there's a strong incentive for individuals to charge at home when they're given the opportunity. B, when individuals charge at home in an uncontrolled manner, the residential peak tends to increase dramatically because the, the EV charging load is coincident with the non-EV charging load of the residents. And C, there's a considerable um, opportunity to charge EVs at other times when they're parked at home, mainly in the middle of the night when the load is, is the peakest, is, the, is the, the residential load is the smallest. And so the, the, the strategy that we wanted to look at was um, what is a very efficient way to shift the EV charging load, you know, first use case at residences from peak hours to off peak hours in the middle of the night? thereby reducing the, the, the peak, the system-wide peak, and also flattening the load profile because the minimum load also comes up. So we have a flatter load profile, which is you know, easier for the utilities to serve because there's, it requires less daily cycling of the generation if the load pro profile is flatter, flatter. And we wanted to be able to do this, again, not for you know, tens of vehicles or hundreds of vehicles. We wanted to figure out an effective way to do this computationally for tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of vehicles using, um, you know, without the use of a supercomputer, and it has to be able to compute um, in, the, in the time domain that the vehicles are charging in. So that's kind of just a quick backdrop on the area of, our, of, the, of this control strategy and the motivations um, of developing it. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. Okay, yep, so that's a summary. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Um, so there's a couple different approaches when we started doing this that we could look at. Um, one is a, a, a decentralized approach and the other is a centralized approaches approach. And both of these approaches have, you know, strong points and they both have, um, you know, potential limitations that that might need to be overcome. You know, decentralized approach, approaches, temp typically there's um, the computational complexity many times is lower. Um, the amount of communication needed, you know, well, it, it depends on the architecture. For some architectures you need less, but for others you could possibly need more. Um, but it's, for a decentralized approach, it, sometimes it's difficult to achieve system -wide, a system-wide optimum. For the centralized approaches, um, since it's uh, centralized, getting a systematic global optimum is, is a lot easier than a decentralized approach. You know, that's, you can, you, I mean, if you know all the constraints, you can use optimization solvers to come up with a, with a global optimum. Um, Network-wide communication is required for the centralized approach. But the biggest issue with the centralized approach is that the computational complexity increases quickly as the PEV population size increases. So if we're talking about tens of vehicles, not a big deal. If we're talking about hundreds of thousands of vehicles, the size of the optimization problem becomes humongous. You know, for, for instance, um, when we, the way that we, we and this will be mentioned in, in in some following slides, but what we used is we used a 
um, a prediction horizon. So we're looking forward um, 24 hours, and we and we did a, a discrete optimization um, where the each time step is the terminology we used. We're trying to um, allocate energy. The centralized aggregator allocates energy to all the vehicles for five, 10, or 15 minute time steps. You know, we, we pick a time step. So let's say we, we have a five minute time step. So for the five minute time steps um, over a 24 hour prediction horizon, or, or a 15 minute time step, for 15 minute time step over a 24 hour prediction horizon is 96 di distinct decision variables for a single vehicle because there's 96 15 minute time periods in a 24 hour period, okay? And if we have you know, 100,000 vehicles, then the, the total number of decision variables to solve that is there's 96 decision variables for each vehicle, and if there's 100,000 vehicles, we're almost at 10 million decision variables, which is a very, very large um, optimization problem. And so with centralized approaches, a lot of times the, the computational complexity, the number of decision variables, the number of constraints increases with the number of electric vehicles, which is a problem if you want to control the charging of tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of electric vehicles. Okay, next slide. So with, with this in mind, what we decided to focus our work on um, was to overcome this major barrier to centralized charging for a large number of, of electric vehicles. Um, and we came up with a novel approach to overcome this barrier, barrier and it's basically a two-stage hierarchical optimization routine. And it'll be described in the next slide, or maybe two slides. So um, the general architecture we used is we used a third-party aggregator which is where the, the centralized optimization is done. And this aggregator you know, communicates with each of the electric vehicles um, one time every uh, time step. So the, the process generally is um, the electric vehicles, once every five minutes, if we're using a five minute time step, the electric vehicles communicate to the aggregator their charging needs. You know, and they're, they're Charging need information consists of um, how much energy is required for them to meet their, their charging requirements, um, their arrival time, their departure time, and also the, what their max charge rate is, which is very similar to the to previous presentation. But those are the, typically the, the, the charging information that the vehicles communicate to the aggregator. The aggregator then um, takes that information, calculates uh, the, the, the global optimum, and then, it, and then it communicates back to each of the vehicles their energy set point. So it tells each of the vehicles for the next time step, this is how much energy you can you know, draw from the grid. Communicates that to all the vehicles. The vehicles then are in charge of how they draw that energy over time, which allows vehicles the opportunity to you know, provide things like voltage regulation or frequency regulation, or where they are able to change their, their amount of power they're drawing in real time, depending on current voltage um, or frequency uh, changes in the system. Um, okay, so this here is uh, summarizing this this approach. So here we're using a 15-minute time step. So first, the all the information that the aggregator needs from the vehicles is communicated is sent to the aggregator, which includes um, the aggregator also needs to have a forecast of what a potent of charging needs required into the future in order to do a global optimum over time. And then it, it uses its two-stage optimization to, to come up with its, um, its global optimum. Then it you know, calculates energy set points for all the vehicles the next time step, communicates that to them. And then the whole entire prediction horizon just shifts in time. So this, this whole process is done every, in this case, with a 15-minute time step. Every 15 minutes, it goes through this entire process. So every 15 minutes, the um, optimization needs to be performed again. 
which poses a, a real-time constraint on how long we actually have to perform the calculation. If we have a 15-minute time step, we can't spend three hours trying to, to figure out what, you know, what, how much energy each of the electric vehicles should be drawing for the next time step. It has to be fast. It has to be preferably quite a bit faster than the selected time step. Okay, let's go to the next slide real quick. So right here for this two-stage hierarchical, hierarchical optimization. So the optimization over the prediction horizon um, consists of consists of two different parts. Um, one part is in the is in the domain of like the vehicle level domain, and the other part is in an in a um, aggregated domain, if you will. So the the objective of the optimization is to is to determine the charging of all of the electric vehicles over the entire prediction horizon. That's what that's what the objective is. Um, and as was stated previously, in order to do this with a large number of vehicles, the optimization problem becomes very large. There's a lot of decision variables and a lot of constraints. Using this two-stage hierarchical approach, we're able to reduce the size of the optimization problem, reduce the number of decision variables and constraints, so that we can do it with minimal computational resources in a short amount of time. And, and the key insight here is the fact that the optimization is not is not optimizing the amount of energy that every vehicle should draw over the entire prediction horizon. The optimization is allocating the total energy, the total EV charging energy over the prediction horizon. So that's a fundamentally different thing. When, when the optimization is focused on allocating the total electric vehicle charging over the prediction horizon, then the size of the optimization problem, one, is fixed, and two, is very, very small. The number of decision variables is the number of time steps in the prediction horizon. With a prediction horizon of 24 hours, a time step of 15 minutes, that's 96 decision variables. The optimization problem is tiny. So the way that this is accomplished is using this, this you know, hierarchical approach, this two-stage approach. Step one is to aggregate the vehicle constraints. So there are vehicle level constraints. Every vehicle's got constraints. It, vehicle A needs 10 kilowatt hours and it needs to leave in, in four hours. Vehicle B needs two kilowatt hours and it needs to leave in three hours. Vehicle H can charge, its max charge rate is six kilowatts and vehicle B's max charge rate is only you know 3.3 kilowatts and so on. So all of these vehicles have individual constraints that need to be satisfied and so first, we're, we, we figured out a way to aggregate the constraints of the vehicles. So we have a set of aggregate constraints that, that represent the constraints of all the vehicles in the system, step one. Step two is we're, given these aggregate constraints, we solve the reduced order optimization model, which means we allocate the, the total electric vehicle charging energy over the next 24-hour period within the constraints. And then the third step is to deallocate the energy amongst all the electric vehicles for the next time step. So we, so we optimally allocate energy of all electric vehicles over the 24-hour prediction horizon. We see how much energy was allocated for the very next time step, and then we deallocate that energy to the electric vehicles. We need to decide, you know, for the next time step, let's say there's, you know, a, a thousand uh, kilowatt hours of energy that's that's been allocated for all the electric vehicles, but if all the vehicles that are that want to charge are able to charge, let's say it's 20,000 kilowatt hours, so the decision needs to be made of of which vehicles do we allow to charge over the next time step, and we do that with a couple things in mind. But the biggest is we want to make sure that the vehicles that need the energy the most get it, right? We want to make sure all vehicles' charging needs are met, that they that they are able to um, get the energy that they need to by the time they need it before they depart. OK, 
Okay, let's go to the next slide real quick. Okay, so so that it, that um, describes the idea at a high level. There's some information that's needed to do this. Um, you know, one of it is we needed to use some, we wanted to use realistic charging needs data. Basically, what, what we mean by that is um, a data set that describes when the vehicles arrive home in the evening, how long they're parked at home, what their SOC is when they arrive, and what their requested to part SOC is, how much energy they need, essentially. Instead of just making this up, we wanted to have a, you know, a, a realistic data set. And we, and we basically used the EV project data um, to derive that, that information. We didn't use the data directly because, like I said, we had charging for you know, thousands of vehicles. If we want to run a simulation with you know, 500,000 vehicles, you know, we don't have 500,000 vehicles worth of data. But we're able to use some, you know, some um, machine learning and, and, and things to look at the existing data we had and then generate other populations of data that were much larger that had the same general characteristics. Okay, next slide. The other thing that's required are um, accurate models for how electric vehicles behave. Um, you know, as was mentioned in the previous slide, talking about the charge profile, you know, electric vehicles are not um, like when they charge a level two charge for battery sizes that are reasonably small. At high SOCs, it enters that constant voltage mode, and the and the the profile decreases. So we wanted to to develop a strategy, a control strategy that that was as realistic as possible. And so in this platform that we used to test our control strategy, we included uh, models of electric vehicles that were um, based upon and then validated against lab testing of real electric vehicles. So here at INL, we have a lab with where we actually characterize electric vehicles um, to describe how they behave as, as loads on the grid. And then using all that data, we were able to generate um, high fidelity models of how electric vehicles behave as loads on the grid. So right here is a couple charts. You know, the first chart is you know, what the charging profile looks like for a given vehicle. The blue line is, is from the lab test data. And then, the, you know, the orange line is the behavior of the model for the, for the same vehicle. The one on the right is charging efficiency as a function of charge power. Um, the actual charging efficiency data for different charge rates for that given vehicle is, again, the blue dots. And then the orange curve is the way the model behaves. And so these models that we were able to generate um, accurately capture, one, what the, the shape of the charging profile, two, which is the chart on the left. The second thing is the chart on the right, which is um, how, the efficiency of the power electronics. I should clarify. So this is the charging efficiency or the efficiency of the power electronics converting AC energy to DC energy to go into the battery, right? Or AC voltage and current into DC voltage and current for the battery as a function of, time, of power. Also, the battery efficiency is very accurately modeled because not all of the energy that is pushed into, a, into the battery is converted into you know, chemical energy that can then be released by the battery. Some is dissipated by heat. We accurately model the efficiency of the battery. We also accurately model the um, power factor as a function of charge rate and also how the, the vehicle transitions. So when a vehicle starts charging or when it stops charging, when it's ramped up, when it's ramped down, um, it, it's not immediate. It's not a step change. There's a lot of times there's a delay followed by some sort of ramp rate, sometimes multiple ramp rates. And especially when, when you're designing control strategies that, that are asking vehicles to change their, their respective charge rates to turn off and to turn on, it's important to have that actually captured. And those characteristics also were accurately captured for our vehicles and then validated against lab testing data. Okay, uh, so these last two slides, one is we have, um, we have accurate data. Okay, I'll try and wrap up. I'm talking too much. I said it would be fast. It needs to be fast. Um, so we have high-fidelity electric vehicle models. We also have you know, realistic, um, our charging control strategy was tested against realistic data that, that describes you know, when vehicles arrive, when they leave from the EV project data. So then we came up with um, different scenarios. 
So we said, you know, what happens when there's, you know, on a couple of adjacent residential distribution feeders, there's 100,000 homes on the same, on, on these residential feeders. And we want to look at capacity deferral. So we want to reduce the peak load of all of these residences with EV charging. And we want to, want to reduce the peak load specifically by shifting PEV load from the peak hours to the off-peak hours while still meeting everyone's charging needs. And then we studied it for these five different scenarios. And the scenarios were, de were determined based on the percent of, of vehicles that were, or the percent of homes that had an electric vehicle. We did 10%, 30, 50, 70, and then 90% of vehicles. And in the column on the right, it shows the number of charge events in the day. And the reason it's not 10,000 for 10% is not everyone charges every night, right? That's information we get from realistic data. But we can see that we have that tens of thousands of charges that we're looking at. For the 90% scenario, there's almost 90,000 electric vehicle charges that are actively managed by the control strategy in this, in this test. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So right here, this is showing what the, the total load looks like for, this, for these 100,000 homes. On the left, we have uncontrolled charging for the different scenarios. And on the right, we have the controlled charging. So the uncontrolled charging, um, the, the lowest line is just the base residential load for those 100,000 homes. It, it, so there's no electric vehicle charging. And then as the electric vehicle charging, we can see that the uh, that the electric vehicle charging energy is coincident with the, with the non-PEV residential load, which causes the peak to increase dramatically. And on the right, using the control strategy, we can see that, that the most, if not like most of the PEV charging energy is able to be shifted into the nighttime hours, which does a couple of things. One is it reduces the peak and it also flattens the load. So the minimum, is also higher. So the, the amount of, of generation that needs to be um, dispatched or ramped up and down to, to accommodate daily variations in load is also decreased. Um, there, it's important to note that the reason that, there's, that there is still some EV charging energy during peak hours is because those vehicles had to charge during peak. For instance, someone comes home at you know, 4 o'clock and they need to leave at 6 o'clock right? Because they're planning on going to the movies or the grocery store and they plug in their car. So the opportunity to shift that charging energy in that case does not exist. We can't charge at three in the clock. They need to charge now. So that's what that energy represents. Okay, let's go to the next slide. And now we, we make full loop back to computational time. The whole objective of our control strategy was to be able to control the charging of the vehicles um, using a centralized approach and, and figure out some way to do that with tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of vehicles and not have to do it on a supercomputer and take 12 hours, right? So these times here are showing on a, just an ordinary laptop. It's a laptop with four gigs of RAM. It's got a, like an Intel i3, i7 processor in it, just an ordinary laptop that's probably five years old. We ran these scenarios on them. And for the, if we focus on the 90% there, that represents we're actively charging almost 90,000 vehicles. And the computational time, the time it took to, to find the optimal solution is, you know, anywhere from 1 to 1.25 seconds. That's all the amount of time it took, which is, which is extremely small, and it makes this, this, this approach, um, you know, scalable, by the number of vehicles and computationally efficient. And this was kind of the, the, the whole goal of, I mean, it was the, it was kind of the, the point of the research, if you will. Um, and we also did, we did a simulation for a million vehicles where we'd run a million vehicles through the control strategy and there it took anywhere from 10 to 15 seconds to, to find the optimal solution. And so in a, in a, in a deployment situation, this control strategy, if, if ever it's needed for an entity to um, control that many vehicles to obtain, you know, system-wide benefits, such as reducing the amount of um, the peak load of a city, for instance, or a set of distribution feeders that are adjacently located, or to flatten the dot curve or, or to um, achieve these, you know, kind of system-wide objectives, 
using this, this approach, that can be done with minimal computational resources in a handful of seconds, which makes it a feasible way to go. Okay, next slide. So these are the quick con conclusions. Um, and I won't read through those, but uh, I guess I'll open it up for questions. So you, so you can ask questions in the last 10 minutes. Okay. Th th thank you, Don. Uh, I've always benefited from your work and Idaho National work on the insight you provided on actually testing those chargers in the real world. Uh, what I really like also in your presentation is how you highlighted it is important that the computational time is low. We can develop all the control strategies we want, but if they take hours and days to run, then we're not going to be able to reuse them. So thank you. I'll just have a quick look to check if we received any questions. I'll just stop sharing here. Okay. So, sorry. Zohair is asking, I think this is for Don, are the energy set points updated after each time interval? Yes, yep. Yep, so the vehicles are receiving energy set points every, once every time step. So if it's 15 minutes, every 15 minutes, the vehicle communicates the aggregator. These are my charging needs. The aggregator finds the optimal solution. The aggregator communicates back to every vehicle. For the next 15 minutes, you draw this much energy and then the vehicles do that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Zach actually has the same question that I had for you. What solved it for the computation time experiment? Uh, what, what was the question? I what solver did you use for the computation time experiment? Oh, the solver, we used an open source, that's a great, that's, that's a great thing I left out. We actually use an open source solver, CVX OPT is what we used. We didn't have to use Groby or any of these high-end the solvers. Yeah. Yep. And you said you used it instead of what? Oh, uh, like Groby is a high-end solver that's, that always reaches, you know, that reaches optimal so solution a high percentage of the time and it's very, very fast. And we didn't need to use Groby or these other CPLEX. We used just CVXOPT, which was open source. Excellent. Okay. Uh, and the reason we're able to do that is because the optimization problem is just so small. Okay. Uh, one question for me, for both of you. Did you use the state of charge of the vehicle? Did you manage to get this information or you had to do some uh, uh, estimation of what it could be? So do you want me to go first, or who, who are you asking? Go first, Don. Okay. What was the question? It was, did we have to do estimation of what? The state of charge. So how much, how do you know how much energy is left on the car so you can decide if you can control the charge or not? Oh, okay. So for us, what we did is, is we were running simulations in our lab, and these simulations were actually, we, we had them interconnected with the real-time digital simulator, so they were run in real time. Um, but all of the, the charging needs information we generated using the EV project data use and machine learning to come up with a large data set of charging needs that have, you know, similar characteristics. I don't know if that answers the question or not. Was it easy for you to collect the state of charge of those cars and use it in your optimization? Oh, you mean you mean you mean every single time step? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So the information that the vehicles communicate to the aggregator um, is we don't pass state of charge. The, the vehicle is in charge of it, in knowing its own state of charge. The vehicle is in charge of knowing um, what its what its state of charge needs to be when it leaves. And so all it tells the aggregator is it says, I still need this much energy. 
And the vehicle does all that translation because the vehicle knows its current state of charge, the vehicle knows its requested depart state of charge, the vehicle knows the oh. size of its battery. Oh, okay. The vehicle just tells the aggregator, I need this much energy, and the aggregator's working how, in the energy domain. You know, how, like, uh, this information is not easily transferable from the cars. Oh, you mean from real vehicles, how this would be implemented yeah. with actual vehicles. Yes, so that was something that we did not treat. So, so, so in our case, we're doing it in simulation, and one of the assumptions is, you know, in order for this control strategy to work, vehicles need to be able to communi communicate this type of information to a third-party aggregator, mm -hmm. right? So that was assumed that they'd be able to do that in the future. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, that was uh, Zach, that they have a startup company using their control algorithms. What's happening with you? Are there any plans to deploy these? Yeah, so so yeah, so we, we run into this problem a lot. So the, the J1772 standard, which is common for level two charging in the US, doesn't have bi-directional communication. Uh, the only communication per the protocol is a pilot signal, which is the control signal sent to the car. Um, so the way we currently do it is through the mobile app that I mentioned. And so we ask users to tell us how much energy their car needs, essentially. Um, and then we just integrate the, what we measure as the actual charging, the current draw of the car over time to estimate the amount of energy that we've delivered to the car. Um, so that's our current system. What we find is that users don't tend to be very accurate. So that was a part of my presentation where we went into the data analysis that I didn't get to today. Um, but users don't tend to be very accurate, so we're looking at ways to extract um, better predictions of user, how much energy a user might actually want based on their previous data of how they've used the system in the past. So if a person every day usually draws nine kilowatt hours of energy, um, if they're lazy and just leave their request as 20 kilowatt hours, we can detect that um, and then adjust our algorithm accordingly. Okay, thank you. There's a question about, are you planning to start using or simulating vehicle to grid? How I'm easy sure can it be adapted to allow the inclusion of bidirectional charging? So I can mention from our perspective. Um, so so uh, the simulating, the open source simulator portion of what I mentioned, um, we are thinking of how to integrate that with do, to be able to allow vehicle to grid integration. The issue we have right now is I don't have a good model of uh, battery behavior in the discharge state. I just don't have the data. Um, I know there are good models for that. Um, once that's integrated in, the, the simulator should be able to support V to G. Um, we just haven't been as interested in it because we don't have the hardware to be able to support it in, in real systems. Yeah. yeah, and I'll add that we haven't really looked at that because most OEMs are not developing vehicles that are able to do V to G at level two charging. So it's, it's kind of something that's a little bit further out. But at least when we did this work, you know, a year or two ago, Okay, and there is one last question, but I don't really understand it. Maybe one of you can read it. I think it's everyone can see it. And check if you can answer it. So where, where are you looking at? Oh, is it the chat where you're reading yeah, the, the chat. question? Yeah, last question. Oh. Yeah, I mean, I'll take a quick stab at that one. So, I mean, it kind of depends on the, um, the architecture of the decentralized charging algorithm, right? So a decentralized charging algorithm can be designed where there's, you know, a, where it utilizes kind of a centralizing, centralized aggregator 
but the decision making is not done at the aggregator mm -hmm. level. It's done at the at the node level. Every vehicle makes its own decision. So it would be something like vehicles send something up to the aggregator. The aggregator simply just aggregates, adds them all together, and sends it back to the vehicles, and the vehicles make their own decision based on that. I mean, that's one pars possible architecture where a decentralized approach would, <clears throat> you know, have like a centralized communication aggregation point, right? Another way to do it, a decentralized charging algorithm could be individual vehicles just talk with each other, you know? That's another architecture that's possible. And, and in our work, we tended to, we, like we tend to, as we investigate decentralized charging, to use the former rather than the latter because it scales much better when you get into tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of vehicles. Okay, thank you. All right, is that done? Thank you so much for this. I look forward to uh, investigate how we can collaborate more. Uh, I want to end this uh, by saying yes, the webinar will be accessible. And the next one is going to be uh, by uh, Robert from the Open Charge Alliance presenting about the Open Charge, uh, the OCPP. I forgot uh, what it stands for. Uh, but it's one of the most widely used communication tools uh, for electric vehicle charging. All right. Thank you so much, everyone, and hope you can join, join our next webinar. All right. See you guys. Great. Thank you, everyone. Bye.